All right, so today and all of next week, we're going to talk about the atmosphere. There's some new reading, and it's spread out over several chapters. So the atmosphere is discussed in chapters 8 through 13, and I'm going to have you read um, some of those, um, 8, 10, 12, and 13. So not that there isn't interesting stuff in 9 and 11, uh, but you'll also see 13 is kind of a short, like putting it all together uh, chapter. And the topics we're going to cover are unfortunately spread out between these. Today will pretty much be chapter eight, which is um, the structure of the atmosphere and dynamics and all that kind of stuff. And we're going to start, we'll get at the end today to some of the conditions that allow for stratospheric ozone depletion, which is a natural phenomenon, regardless of... Um, you know, what humans have been doing to the atmosphere to promote this, to make this a whole deeper, which we'll talk about next time. And that, this topic is discussed in multiples of these chapters. And then that'll be on Tuesday and on Thursday next week, we're going to talk about photochemical smog, tropospheric ozone, and also acid oxides and acid rain, so all together. So, uh, and there will be a homework assignment on, on this uh, topic and that will come from the week. So <clears throat> the first thing we want to talk about is to think just a little bit about how the atmosphere is structured and what it has. And these are kind of the important considerations that we want to think about. Like where is heat distributed and um, how much is in different layers and how does that affect the chemistry? What is the structure of the atmosphere? Just like the oceans and stratified bodies of water, the atmosphere is stratified Certain kinds of chemistry happen in certain kinds of places. And we're going to focus pretty much on the bottom part of the atmosphere, the troposphere and the stratosphere, which we'll define what those mean in a second, which have different kinds of chemistry that happens very high up in the rarefied atmosphere. Um, <clears throat> but to understand that, we also have to understand how pressure and temperature change as we go from the surface of the Earth. Uh, something about the energy balance and absorption of solar energy from the atmosphere. And this will become important the week after next when we talk about global warming and why adding gases to the atmosphere upsets the temperature balance and causes climate change. Um, and we also want to talk a little bit about atmospheric inversions and the concept of lapse rate today because that um, determines to some extent whether or not air masses stagnate in certain areas. Like for instance, if we get inversions, which lead to things like uh, photochemical smog and acid rain, which will become important. So first thing to think about is the kind of modulating factor that our um, atmosphere gives us. We should be glad that we have an atmosphere and it is full of greenhouse absorbing gases, water, and CO2. If, it, if we didn't have that, then we'd have a much bigger temperature extreme. And when you only look at the moon, which is essentially the same distance from the sun as the earth, without an atmosphere to look at the extremes between the day and night temperatures, right? They're very, very big. And so uh, the fact that we have gases in our atmosphere that absorb and modulate and regulate temperature and distribute themselves between the night and the day regions and the poles and the equators helps to make this variation a lot less. So that, you know, on the moon, we have about a 250 degree C range between night and day and on Earth it's about 25 degrees C. So that's part of what makes the planet habitable. And the atmospheric gases move around. What we think of as climate and weather are pretty much restricted to the troposphere, which we'll define in a second, that's the lowest part of the atmosphere. And most of the heat that causes the churning of things, which we talked about at the beginning of the semester, if you recall, comes from the sun. Something like 99.98 or so percent of the heat that is distributed in the atmosphere is solar. There are little bits of other um, sources of heat, tidal dissipation and radioactive heat, but they account for essentially none of the, you know, at least for, for, for a lion's share of the um, heat budget. We also, we've talked before about how bodies of water are heated from above from sunlight impinging on their tops and the atmosphere is heated from below. We're, we're gonna dissect this a little bit more today, what we mean by that because that's what helps set up the convection. And this just um, you know, shows you these other two sources of heat as, as we've seen this slide earlier in the semester. So this is a heat budget from the perspective of solar radiation, 100 units of solar radiation coming in in a visible wavelength. So ultraviolet is not on here. Ultraviolet will become important 
when we talk about all the chemistry that happens in the atmosphere, the photochemistry especially, um, that's related to ozone destruction and smog and so forth. But when it comes to heat content, it's going to be visible and infrared. So the visible wavelengths and slightly longer wavelengths than our eyes can perceive, which are infrared. And you'll see that of 100 units that come in, half of it manages to reach the land surface. The other half is reflected back out into space, uh, some of it backscattered by air, some by clouds, some um, reflected, um, and some is absorbed by various molecules. We'll talk about that in a second. And then we also see that there's, of the amount that goes back, of the 100 that comes in, something just slightly less than a third bounces back out into space as albedo, as visible wavelength light, the, something that if you were on another planet looking at us with a telescope, you would be able to see visibly, that's, that's our albedo. Of course, albedo varies all over the planet. It's not constant. You know, certain things reflect more light than others. Ice sheets reflect more light than liquid water. Continents that are desert uh, or not forested reflect a lot more light than forested regions. So this is, this is an average for the whole planet. And then you'll see here that of that original 100, something a little bit more than two thirds goes on is a long wave radiation, which is longer wavelength stuff that we can't visibly see, but it's in the infrared. And if this were to just bounce straight out into space without any interaction with the atmosphere, then it wouldn't really have any impact on the temperature structure of the atmosphere, but it does have an impact. It turns out that a lot of this wavelength of light is absorbed by various molecules, triatomic or larger water, CO2, that's why I mentioned both of them as being greenhouse gases. What they do is absorb some of this wavelength, they use it to excite their uh, vibrational modes within their bonds, it gets manifested as heat content to the atmosphere. Some of that then eventually gets re-radiated out, some back down to the surface there, some out to space. Uh, there are various other sources of heat variation, such as latent heat, which is the evaporation and precipitation of water from you know, vapor to liquid state back and forth. There's some heat exchange there. There's some stuff that happens with clouds, et cetera. But so it's the relative amount of this, these molecules that are in the atmosphere that determine the heat absorbing content of the atmosphere and um, affect how warm the planet feels. Because while ultimately all of this light will re-radiate back out of space, is a question of how much of it is stored for how long in the atmosphere. So this is another look at that same, it's got essentially the same balance. On the last slide, this was 31 and that was 69. Um, with a slightly different way of, of kind of categorizing this more from a climate perspective, the role of specifically the greenhouse effect, which is the absorption of those greenhouse gas molecules, radiating heat, out to space and back down to the surface of the earth, the role of clouds um, and um, the role of evaporation of water. And evaporation of water is complicated because there's a latent heat that we have to consume some energy to take liquid water and turn it into vapor. But when we put the vapor in the atmosphere, we increase the greenhouse effect. So these things are kind of like a lever on each other. The more we evaporate, the more heat we consume, but then the more heat we are able to store in the atmosphere. And in fact, this effect is bigger than this effect in terms of heat content in the atmosphere. And so as you can imagine through Earth's history, and we'll talk about this a little bit more when we get to climate change, um, these numbers haven't been constant, right? Just think about the difference between an ice age and an interglacial like we have today, even without human activities, the balance that allows the Earth to grow more ice sheets uh, and glaciers would have there be more of the light coming out as reflected light and less of it as uh, infrared radiation, which would lower the heat content of the atmosphere, which would allow the ice sheets to grow. Some of this is forced by external mechanisms, meaning how the Earth orbits the sun and the various uh, parameters, but some of this is also controlled by other things that store heat on the Earth, so that we know that whereas the orbital fluctuations have been with us for four and a half billion years, we haven't always had periods of time in our history where we've had uh, glaciation and not glaciation, right? That sort of started with the Quaternary. And there have been periods in the past where we've had 
extensive glaciation too, but for most of the uh, Paleogene and going back into the Cretaceous and the Jurassic Age, so there was no ice anywhere on it. We were still having our orbital parameters, but that arrangement of the continents and the way the oceans circulate, the way they store heat, would put Earth into a condition where it couldn't flip back and forth between sort of more um, solar radiation coming out invisible versus the infrared. And that is what you need, special circumstances to allow this to happen, to be able to have climate swings like we've had with the turn. So this greenhouse absorbing capability really comes down to chemistry. If you've had a chemistry class where you've done um, infrared spectroscopy of substances, infrared spectroscopy is a really useful technique because you can identify specific kinds of chemical bonds because they absorb wavelengths, have very specific wavelengths. Like an OH bond absorbs very specific wavelengths of light in the infrared. CO bonds, single bonds, or they could be double bonds, they also absorb very specific wavelengths and it helps you identify what's, what's in the molecule. But what's really going on is that the infrared light um, excites the various kinds of vibrational modes that we have within chemical bonds. So chemical bonds can be thought of as springs that um, have a certain amount of vibration back and forth. And if the vibration gets too big, then the bond breaks, right? And that happens in the atmosphere. Uh, water can absorb enough infrared light that it breaks up into hydroxyl radicals and hydrogen radicals. And we'll talk about that process in a second. But if we absorb only so much light and we don't break it apart, then we can excite a mode like this. So it looks like that, you know, where the bonds are getting bigger and shorter. We can also uh, excite modes that have, they, these all absorb slightly different wavelengths where um, we're changing the angle uh, between the bonds. And um, we can excite modes where one bond is stretching and one bond is um, shrinking. Uh, simultaneously. And the important thing is that all of these happen in the infrared. So the more water, CO2, which are the two largest greenhouse gas absorbers in our atmosphere we have, the more greenhouse radiation in, in the infrared wavelength is going to be captured by the atmosphere and held, which is what accounts for this current balance. So this number goes up when we have more water and CO2 in the atmosphere, and that number goes down when we have less. Other molecules also absorb. Um, all you need is to have at least three atoms. So the at molecules that don't absorb in the infrared are diatomic molecules like O2 and N2, and obviously you know, monatomic species like argon, which is the third most important gas in our atmosphere, they don't absorb. So it's really things that are of a certain size and shape that, that absorb. And of those, water and CO2 are the two dominant so you can imagine that this absorption of heat and storing of heat in the atmosphere and therefore heating up of the lower atmosphere and the planet can set up something called a positive feedback loop. So for instance, the hotter the planet gets, the more water evaporates and the hotter the atmosphere gets and therefore even more water can evaporate. And so um, in this kind of scenario, the more heat you put into the system, the hotter the system keeps getting. Now, there are things that keep the Earth from becoming overly hot through this mechanism. And out of interest, one of the things that we think happened at some time in the distant past on Venus, which is very similar to our planet, is that it, it put so much of its carbon dioxide in the atmosphere that it went into an unchecked state where it couldn't recover and basically uh, stored so much heat that it's become very hot and, and uninhabitable and no, obviously no water to be found except in the atmosphere. <clears throat> So what keeps this check is what we call a negative feedback loop. Because another thing that happens is if you put enough water in the atmosphere, it saturates. So when it saturates, it nucleates droplets, which make clouds. Clouds reflect light. So clouds contribute to cooling of the planet. And they primarily contribute to cooling through this mechanism, right? Directly reflecting of solar energy. But if we increase this, then we have less light that can come down to the surface of the Earth that can then ultimately bounce back in the infrared. So if you make a very, very cloudy planet, you will cool things. And so that we call a negative feedback. And these two things have worked together roughly to keep the planet within kind of a relatively narrow range of temperature swings during ice ages and warm periods. The most extreme temperature variations we find are up near the poles, and it's about eight degrees C or so. And at the equator, it's rarely more than a degree 
of variation. There have been periods of time in the past where we think this may have been a little bit higher, like during the snowball earth period of the Proterozoic, but not much higher. And, um, and so really what we're looking at is the interaction between how these two things happen, plus other things that happen in the atmosphere that help contribute to um, reflecting of light, especially particles. So naturally particles are going to the atmosphere based on the strength of the winds on the planet. Uh, but also this is another way that humans are vastly affecting the atmosphere, which is putting particulates into the atmosphere, especially the stratosphere, primarily by um, you know, intercontinental airplane flights and exhaust that's produced. But there's other mechanisms that put, put particles too, and particles will reflect some light. We'll talk about all of that stuff a week after next when we talk about global warming. So the atmosphere, we have the light coming down, bouncing off, changing wavelength, some fraction of it. And this is why we say the atmosphere is heated from below, right? The, the, and part of the heating is the storage of that heat content in the form of infrared radiation by greenhouse gases. So this, these are two couple of diagrams. This is a, a diagram with pressure and temperature. This is in log units. So zero is basically one atmosphere pressure like we have here at the surface of the earth. And um, you can see that pressure pretty much just kind of decreases monotonically as we go up. Temperature is more complicated. There are places where as in the shallowest part of the atmosphere and still about 20 kilometers. And this horizon is at different uh, altitudes depending on what latitude we're at. But globally average about 20. Um, the temperature goes down and then the temperature flips and it goes up and then it goes down again. And we're not going to talk about these higher layers, but we are going to talk about the layer below this horizon, which is the troposphere, and the layer just above this horizon, which is the stratosphere. And in fact, part of this temperature inversion comes from the family of chemical reactions that produce ozone, which require a lot of heat storage and therefore contribute to this inversion. <clears throat> So you can see these layers labeled here. You can see where the troposphere and the stratosphere are. The things that we think of as weather and climate and the part of the atmosphere that we interact with in terms of the carbon cycle and the water cycle pretty much happened in the troposphere, right? Since the advent of flying between the continents and going into the stratosphere, we now interact more often with the stratosphere than we would have at any time before you know, maybe the last half century in human history. But um, there are other things that happen on Earth that we'll be talking about in the next couple of weeks that happen in the stratosphere that affect the climate and weather uh, in the troposphere. So the interrelationship between those two things is kind of important. And you'll see a couple of kind of important other things listed on here, like uh, you see this reaction where it says O3 plus HV um, in a specific wavelength goes to O2 plus oxygen. So HV, which is um, an abbreviation all the time, the V is actually the Greek letter nu, stands for the frequency of light of a specific frequency. If it were in a wavelength, it would be shown as a lambda. H is Planck's constant. And this <clears throat> basically tells us that when we get high enough up into the atmosphere, ozone is destroyed by absorbing light and breaks down into oxygen molecules and oxygen atoms. What's not shown on here is the reverse reaction, which is what causes this temperature inversion, which also involves the absorption of light, but of a slightly different wavelength, which allows the production of ozone. Ozone exists as a sort of a standing crop chemical that is made, uh, and you can see this layer has some ozone in the stratosphere. And if it weren't there, we wouldn't have life as we know it on the surface of the Earth, because ozone absorbs a lot of ultraviolet light, and that ultraviolet light would otherwise impinge on the surface of the earth and be very damaging to organic molecules such as DNA. So this is a plot of the kind of global composition of the atmosphere. <clears throat> this is a, 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 a type of concentration unit, log scale, for various gases. It's in log number density per centimeter cube. That means in log units, the number of atoms or molecules in a cubic centimeter. And it's just altitude going up. And I've labeled the tropopause on here. And so the stuff that we think about as the atmosphere that we interact with is everything below this yellow line. It's a very small thing. And then the next level up with the stratosphere, uh, which we just talked about, happens up in here. And you can see you know, there's some complications with some of these lines, 
but there's sort of three categories of lines. There are lines that are parallel with each other, right? Like think about this one here for N2 and O2. They basically just decrease as we go up. And that basically reflects this kind of monotonic decreasing pressure. Most of the major gas species that make up the bulk of the atmosphere don't have a ton of chemistry associated with them. And so they simply decrease in concentration as we go up. And they're one kind of thing. There's some other stuff that you can pull out of this if you look in detail, like for instance, if you look at the rate relationship between oxygen and nitrogen, you'll see not the N2 and the O2, but the atomic versions, like breaking apart N2 into N atoms, and O2 into O atoms, you'll find there's actually more elemental oxygen at low elevation than nitrogen. And that's because oxygen has a slightly weaker bond and is more prone to break than molecular nitrogen. And in fact, a lot of chemistry in the atmosphere is mediated by the fact that we make oxygen atoms or oxygen radicals. Um, you'll also see that, it, um, not shown on this diagram, but at very high elevations, we're pretty much left with just hydrogen and helium. Okay, they're the ones that, that manage to reach the very highest parts of the atmosphere. And part of this has to do with the gravitational attraction of molecules and, and gas species. So the heavier they are, the more we find them concentrated near um, the surface of the Earth due to gravitation and hydrogen and helium become dominant and very high up in the atmosphere. And the last thing to note are the cross-cutting trends, which I'll highlight in a second for you. But you can see like here, for instance, is an oxygen atom, starts really low, cuts across all these things, then bends a corner pretty high up, 100 kilometers or so in the atmosphere, and then just becomes one of the things that is following the parallel trend. So something is producing oxygen atoms. That's why it's cross-cutting these. So all these other gases that are kind of stable are just reducing themselves in concentration as we go up, there are things that are being produced. Here's another one that's being produced, ozone. Then we look at water, it's complicated. It's decreasing with elevation at a much faster rate than all these other gases, right? And so that means that as we move up from the surface of the Earth, we're gonna find less and less water, even below the tropopause in the troposphere on average, and this is because of the conversion of water vapor into liquid and the formation of rain, et cetera. You can see some other gases in here that also follow these trends. And so I've just highlighted, these are the parallel trends, right? The things that, and they, they can be at different concentrations, but there are some chemicals that are not particularly reactive. Then there's these cross-cutting ones and they take various forms, right? Some that are increasing, um, to a point and then start to decrease. This is ozone, for instance, right? So ozone is produced in the bottom part of the stratosphere and then consumed as we go up. So that's why it's got that little pink to it. And then we've got other chemicals that just decrease at a much faster rate than um, these things that are in the parallel trends in blue. And I've highlighted a couple of examples here. Hydroxyl atoms, which are gonna be, as you'll see, they're, they're, these are the very most important mediating um, chemical entity in the atmosphere for producing all the stuff that's involved in smog and ozone layer destruction and pretty much any other kind of chemistry we can pick up in the atmosphere and water. These things are not particularly stable as we get to, you know, even moderate elevations in the atmosphere. They start to break down. That's why they increase or decrease, I should say, with increasing elevation on these kind of flatter trajectories. So the next thing we just want to think about is kind of the stability of the atmosphere, especially down here in the troposphere where we live. I'm sure everyone has heard of inversions. You maybe even lived in a place where inversions happen, such as Southern California, you know, where I lived for about half my life, where um, you get this kind of warm, dry air coming in off the desert and meeting sort of cooler or wet air from the oceans. And these two layers stratify and they cause what's called a chemical inversion. And the wetter, denser atmosphere tends to trap the gases of human activities, which leads to photochemical smog. That's one of the things that inversions can cause. And so what this implies is there's some kind of thing that is preventing the air from vertically mixing. Even if the stuff closest to the bottom should be heating up and should become less dense and rise up, there are other attributes usually related to the amount of water vapor, um, but um, that can also be how air masses move and migrate and are affected by um, topographic features such as mountain ranges and so forth that can um, allow certain more dense waters to spill or to the atmosphere to spill into certain areas and not be um, pushed out by less dense in, as in the case of Southern California. 
So <clears throat> this is just an example of an inversion condition where you've got, for instance, cool air, warm air, cool air, and um, more dense, less dense, again to more dense. And, and it usually takes something more than temperature to decide the conditions that allow the density variations to develop. And those temperatures, and those, those additional things besides temperature are usually water vapor or particulate content. <clears throat> so um, it's useful, I don't wanna go into a ton of detail about this, but it's useful to understand the concept of what we call lapse rate. So la it's a theoretical thing, but we can think of a dry adiabatic lapse rate, which means we have a parcel of air, we're gonna ignore water vapor for a second, and Adiabatic just means no exchange of heat with surroundings. So if you have a parcel of air and it's rising, it should cool. And if, um, if it's able to exchange heat with its surroundings, then it might cool less because the surroundings would be putting heat back into it. So adiabatic is the maximum amount of temperature variation you might expect from a parcel of gas as it rises up from the surface of the earth to some elevation, and you can calculate this yourself using PV equals NRT, that if you change the pressure, you change the volume, you're gonna to have to change the temperature, even if you keep the number of moles of gas uh, the same. So for instance, a, a typical dry lapse rate for raising a parcel of air by a kilometer is about 10 degrees centigrade. This is something that, you know, most people have experienced just growing up in, with elevation, um, usually don't see quite this amount of uh, temperature variation, but you can go from sea level to a, um, you know, a few thousand feet elevation here and feel, you know, about five to 10 degree temperature difference. And that's primarily from the lapse rate. Now, it turns out that that's a theoretical calculation just based on elevations and temperatures and PV equals NRT. People can take weather balloons and they can measure the actual temperature structure in the atmosphere. And that tells you the actual lapse rate, okay? And so if you compare the calculated theoretical lapse rate to the actual temperature structure, and you find a condition where the lapse rate has a higher temperature at its end point than is actually there, then you can predict that parcels of air should continue to rise because they're still gonna be warmer than what is actually present at a, per, at a specific site. Now we'll see when we add water into that, water tends to make these dry lapse rate curves collapse back down to actual. So it makes it more complicated, but we can have two conditions, a case where the lapse rate, the theoretical calculation is on a steeper profile than the actual and then air masses are gonna rise. And if what we calculate is less than what we actually measure, then parcels of air won't rise, and that's what leads to inversions. So this is a condition where here's the actual, and here's the lapse rate calculation. And um, because the parcels of gas are predicted to be cooler than the actual air around it as, as measured, we don't get the rising condition. Now, the next level of complication goes into lapse rates is to account for water vapor. And water vapor, plays a role in two different ways. One is, is that water vapor has an, a special enthalpy associated with, uh, that's different than the enthalpy of um, the other gases in our atmosphere, the nitrogen, the oxygen, the argon as the primary features. And um, it, so it absorbs more heat as it rises, but it also, if it reaches saturation, it can make water vapor turn into little droplets, whether it rains out of the atmosphere or not, doesn't matter that absorbs a certain amount of heat and releases some more heat to the atmosphere uh, when we have that conversion. And so a moist adiabatic lapse rate tends to be about six degrees per kilometer, whereas the dry one was about 10 degrees per kilometer. And again, it depends on how much water is there. But what, what moist does, and so having moisture in the atmosphere tends to limit the lapse rate and contributes to these conditions of inversion because um, the actual variation and the theoretical variation are closer together. And this is just an example of um, you know, a case where we have um, the actual temperature and we have the dry adiabatic la lapse rate and the wet adiabatic lapse rate would be even lower than this. And so that contributes to parcels of air not being able to rise, which gives them, um, the, um, the ability to 
stay in place. So this is kind of what different conditions, lapsing conditions give you. So when we have a strong inversion and the layers of gas can't rise up because they're prevented from doing so, we get things like this is this is the um, actual profile and this is the lapse rate that's calculated. And you're just looking at gases coming out of a smokestack. They would stay at a very, very specific horizon. Whereas in the atmosphere of it, for especially dry and doesn't have um, this constraint or uh, the ability to produce uh, inversion that have a strong lapsing condition, we might see something more like this, where gases sink and rise as a function of their density, the part particle content and everything else. Um, and, and we can have conditions that are sort of in between. And so strong inversion, no inversion, weak inversion. If you can think about all of the legacy chemicals of human activities that require certain conditions to absorb light and cause chemical reactions, as we will be talking about next, that something, a condition like this allows those gases to stay in one place and those reactions to become really intense. Whereas a condition like this, the, where the parcels of gas are moving up and down, um, allows the chemistry to be much more distributed and the chemicals that are produced from that or destroyed in that are spread out over a much greater area. Okay, so um, we I mentioned already the troposphere and the stratosphere. There's a layer called the tropopause, which is just the transition between one to the other. And the tropopause, that elevation above the surface of the Earth is closest to Earth over the poles and farthest from the Earth at the equator. This is approximate, it's a little bit different over the oceans and the continents and other things. But for instance, the tropopause over here in Hawaii is about 25 kilometers up. But if you were to go to the South Pole, it's only about 10 kilometers up. So, you know, a lot of times in diagrams, I'll just um, plot, plot it as a single horizon, but it's really variable around the surface of the Earth. And so everything is below the tropopause, it's called the troposphere, and everything above the tropopause is uh, the first layer is the stratosphere, and then we go up into higher layers, such as the mesosphere. And what's important for us is that most of what we think of as atmospheric water is below the tropopause. Part of the reason for that is the energetics of light that are absorbed by the ozone layer, which sits just above the tropopause, means that gases below the tropopause are experiencing much less of this energetic light and Molecules that are not all that strong, like water molecules, can stay as water molecules because there isn't energetic light to split them up. There's a little, as we'll see, the water does split up, but not nearly as much as happens above the tropopause, where the light is so much more energetic because you're above the ozone layer that we have a lot more destruction of water vapor to make it into hydrogen atoms and hydroxyl radicals, which are both very reactive chemicals that react with a bunch of other stuff. That's why they had those those low angle cross cutting trends. So the stuff that we think about the hydrosphere and the hydrologic cycle for the most part happens in the tropa, below the, the tropopause in the troposphere. It's not to say that the atmosphere above the uh, tropopause is completely dry because it's not, but there's very little water vapor there. And a lot of the water vapor is locked up in, in complicated chemical reactions such as the oxidation of methane being one of the sources of water up there. So this table shows you concentrations of various gases in our atmosphere in a couple of different ways. The concentrations can be given by volume or by weight. Um, and so, you know, in the atmosphere, there, there are other, obviously, you know, um, systems as well, like the number density system, which are useful when it gets a really high up in the atmosphere. But when you're doing calculations or looking at things, you do want to know if the concentrations, which way they're given. There, there you can see that they're all slightly different. And in PPM, parts per million, then concentrations of the major gases in our atmosphere, the major gases being nitrogen, oxygen, and argon, which most people learn as being sort of 80%, 20%, and um, a couple percent, are expressed differently because they're in parts per million, whereas percents are in parts per hundred. So they're multiplied by 10 to the full. So you can see what the major gases are, and then you can see what the next group of gases below that. So carbon dioxide is the next most important gas in our atmosphere, but the concentrations are a lot lower. This actually happens to be from a textbook 
that I used in the 80s when I took geochemistry, where this number was 320, right? At the start of the Industrial Revolution, CO2 was about 280. And, you know, I don't know, about uh, 15 years ago, I edited this thing and put it to 365. And then a few years ago, I made it 410. Uh, this year, it's 414. You know, it's obviously CO2 is going up. Um, but you can get a kind of an idea of the scale. It's still small. It's like a 30th of the argon, which is the third most abundant gas in our atmosphere. Then all these other things, these rare gases like neon, helium, and krypton, they're there, but they're really small. And then all the stuff that is going to be important for talking about chemistry in the atmosphere, like nitrogen oxides, hydrogen, um, even water vapor are low and variable. Water vapor can become very important, like if you're very low in the atmosphere, right above the oceans, but average out over the entire um, troposphere is relatively low. It's somewhere of the same orders as CO2. So um, on this list, these are the things that don't vary very much except, uh, excuse me, water vapor. And not on this list, the things that we want to be thinking about are other gases that are produced by various things at the surface of the Earth that vary in space and time. And some of those things are biological, right? So any of the gases that, whether we're talking about human activities or pre-human, uh, for instance, many of the nitrogen species, some of the sulfur species, um, some of the carbon, the oxidized carbon and the methane, these vary as the condition of uh, ecological systems on the planet vary, like between ice ages and warm periods. Uh, you can change the proportion of these gases that you produce. Other things that um, change at times are um, sulfur species that come from volcanoes. Big punctuated eruptions that put sulfur up into the stratosphere, they happen a few times a century and there are measurable impacts on climate, there are measurable impacts on chemistry of the atmosphere. We can tell this by looking at ice cores and looking at the chemistry of the uh, water that is recorded in the polar ice sheets that came from the atmosphere. Um, so those are important. Then there's also some of these things here that um, they're not on the table, but they're important. We're gonna see one of them is ozone which comes from something called photochemical reactions. Photochemical reactions are chemical reactions that require light to make them happen. They require light of a certain energy. Rarely is visible wavelength light enough to make photochemical reactions happen. We usually need to have more energetic light, which means ultraviolet wavelengths. And since water absorbs ultraviolet, the number of photochemical interactions that happen in bodies of water goes almost down to zero. We can find a little bit of photochemistry that happens on surfaces, like rocks uh, you know, being oxidized and so forth, or degradation of certain organic chemicals in the surface layers of soils. But for the most part, photochemistry happens in the atmosphere. It's a really interesting class of uh, chemistry that we'll talk about next that produces and destroys things like ozone, hydroxyl radicals, and various other chemicals, which account for those kind of funny patterns that when we're looking at stuff with elevation. Then the other thing that's not on here are all the molecules that are there in really small proportions. Think about all the organic molecules that come out of both naturally and non-naturally. Think about chlorofluorocarbons and all the other halogenated hydrocarbons. I mean, the amount of CFCs we put into the atmosphere, even at the, our biggest loading, which was in the 70s and 80s, were minuscule. They wouldn't even show up here, but they had devastating effects on the ozone layer. So it doesn't take very much of something to have an impact. And part of the reason for that is whether or not those chemicals interact with the light that's present. It doesn't take very much of something if it's going to break apart into very reactive chemicals to have an effect on some of the major chemicals in the air. So this is from your text. And this is basically, again, it's got a volume for cents. So if you want to convert these into PPMs, you'd have to multiply each of these numbers by 10 to the four for a whole bunch of gases. And the thing I wanted to point out here is the major sources and the major sinks, the things that remove them. And so you'll see sort of three or four things. You'll see biogenic, meaning coming out of the biosphere, photochemical, meaning produced in the atmosphere by this chemical reaction with light, and you'll see anthropogenic, meaning driven by human activities. And sometimes you can have multiples, um, but you can imagine that um, for some of these cases, like these chlorofluorocarbons, 
anthropogenic is the only source. There's really no natural source. And then you look at, well, how, how are they removed from the atmosphere? Photochemical destruction is common for almost all of these. A couple of them say washed out by precipitation, which means that those particular chemicals are not reactive enough, even in the presence of energetic light, to be broken apart. And instead, they dissolve into water and they get washed back out of the atmosphere. But the lion's share of these things participate in photochemical reactions. So the more of uh, any one of these chemicals that say photochemical destruction we put into the atmosphere that have an anthropogenic part of their column, the more reactive we make the atmosphere, and therefore the more we affect the balance of the natural proportion of chemicals in the atmosphere that are affected by uh, photochemistry, such as ozone. Ozone layer has thinned and thickened and varied seasonally and uh, geographically throughout all of Earth's history, as far as we know. But it's our adding of these things into the atmosphere, which upset a balance of destruction and formation and promotes more destruction, which is what causes additional thinning that would naturally be present. And it's really a very complicated set of chemical reactions that um, involve a variety of parameters. So in addition to light, which is super important, especially ultraviolet light for photochemistry, another really important thing are particles. It turns out that because in the atmosphere, unlike other places on Earth, the molecules that are potentially going to react with each other need to have occasions where they come together. And that becomes more and more difficult, more and more rarefied as you go up through the atmosphere, that a lot of the chemistry takes place on small particle surfaces. Chemicals, uh, molecules of gas stick onto a particle surface. They can commingle with each other. They can absorb light and react. And um, it's one of the ways that we get photochemistry. Another thing that particles can do is act as a third body. And so when we take molecules and we excite them with energetic light, uh, oftentimes, if they undergo a chemical reaction, they just break apart again, unless they have a third body to transfer their energy to, which is what particles are, they can pull away some of that energy in a form of kinetic energy, particles just moving around a little bit more. And so um, these two things together cause atmospheric chemical reactions in the form of photochemistry. And so as you can imagine, there's a lot more variation in particles in the troposphere. Um, because of not just human activities, but even natural things to think about weather events and uh, the stuff that we think of as wind and rain, et cetera. Um, but there isn't very much of the energetic light from the sun, right? And when you get up above into the stratosphere, there's fewer particles, but there's more energetic light. So the balance of these two things changes. But one of the things humans have done to the atmosphere that's pretty dramatic because we've added way more particles in the lower part of the stratosphere just by flying planes through there all the time. Think about every particle that comes out of, out of the exhaust. Um, so we've increased the number density of particulates in the stratosphere by something like a factor of 10, which just makes it all the more reactive. Even if we don't change the number of gas species that are present, which we've also changed. But even if all we did was put in particles, we just give it more potential for chemical reactions. So then we also have to think other things that affect the chemistry, what we have in the atmosphere, are things that vary on the surface of the Earth in their input functions by uh, geographic region, things, processes that have daily and seasonal time scales. Think about like the evaporation of water, for instance, or biologically driven processes between um, the seasons or night and dark. And superimposed on that, these can all be natural. We have anything added to the atmosphere by human activity. So there's a lot that can go on to affect chemistry in the atmosphere. So different gases in the atmosphere can play different roles, just like um, any chemical can in the hydrologic cycle, for instance. And these are some of the roles that different chemicals can um, take on. And some chemicals are in here more than once. But for instance, some chemicals just act as inorganic oxides. Some things act as oxidants. Some things act as reducing agents. We have organic molecules. We have things that are acids and bases and salts. And then things that are photochemically very reactive because they're unstable. We're going to talk about these a lot more. And that's just a small subset. 
but there are different processes that chemicals can undergo in the atmosphere. <clears throat> Another thing we have to think about is for those chemicals that are reactive, meaning they interact with light at some point on elevation gradient up from the surface of the earth, how long do they last in the atmosphere? Right? <clears throat> so this is a table of some categories of gases, carbon monoxide, N2O, chlorofluorocarbons, halons, hydrofluorocarbons, hydrofluorocarbons, methane, et cetera, et cetera. Um, <clears throat> you will see that some of these gases last for a very, very long time, thousands of years for perfluorocarbons, right? And they are destroyed above the mesosphere. So that's the layer above the stratosphere. Those can get pretty high up in the atmosphere. So this being long and this being high tells us this is a relatively stable molecule. We stick it in the atmosphere. Yeah, there's all this energetic light, but it's going to destroy other things before this because it's not very chemically reactive. We go to the flip side and we look at <clears throat> here's something that destroy in hours to years, hours to days. These are chemicals that are very, very reactive. As soon as they get into the atmosphere and they experience even a whiff of this energetic light, they want to break apart. And in so doing, they're going to break apart. They're going to interact with other things. So for instance, nitrogen oxides, which we put into the atmosphere by burning fossil fuels, um, gets destroyed relatively quickly, but um, it's destroyed by the interaction with hydroxyl radicals and ozone. <clears throat> that changes the balance of hydroxyl radicals and ozone, which play a very important role in overall atmospheric chemistry, as we're going to see on a slide coming up. So it upsets the balance of those things. <clears throat> then we have things like carbon dioxide, nitrogen oxides, chlorofluorocarbons. These play various roles. Chlorofluorocarbons, for instance, playing a role in ozone layer thinning with a lifetime of about 50 years. Carbon dioxide, you know, years to uh, decades, um, N2O longer. So for instance, um, methane shorter, uh, methane oxidizes into CO2 in the atmosphere. But when we think about the family of gases that are greenhouse gases that we talk about, even though <clears throat> some of these molecules absorb more greenhouse gas per unit molecule than others, they also have different lifetimes. So we have to think about that, them from that perspective as well. For now, we're going to think about the really reactive chemicals, the ones that, that have the very short half-lives uh, on this diagram and their perspective of what they do to um, the reactiveness of the lower atmosphere. So <clears throat> there's this overall uh, kind of category of chemistry they talk about, which is called photochemistry. And photochemistry is basically the main requirement is that you need light to make it happen. And what the light is actually doing is taking electrons, whether they're in bonds or they're valence electrons, and putting them into what we call the excited state, some elevated energy status where, therefore, things can undergo chemical reactions. They don't undergo reactions that we call the ground state. And when they're excited, um, this happens. Now, it turns out that these uh, reactive species that absorb light, they don't last very long. So the vast majority of the times that chemicals in the atmosphere absorb light and get promoted to the excited state, they dissipate that energy again and go back to the ground state and don't do any chemical reaction. It's the, when we have the chance occurrence of gas molecules in the gas state or on the surface of a particle or something else that we even have the opportunity to have this photochemical reaction take place. So um, this just kind of explains in the most basic sense, how the absorption of light um, promotes electrons in um, bonds, molecular bonds, into higher energy states that don't break the bond, but make the molecule more reactive. And so, you know, you have to dig back to, to when you learn chemistry, you're taught some very simple ways to think about molecular bonds as, for instance, linear combination of atomic orbitals, you can either hybridize those orbitals, think about like sp3 orbitals, uh, for instance, which is there are four, four of those that are arranged around a tetrahedron. You can combine sp3 orbitals on two uh, entities like the hydrogen atom and an oxygen atom in water, you can make a bond. But whenever you take two um, 
bonds on two atoms, or excuse me, two orbitals on two atoms and make a bond, you actually make two bonds. You make a bond and an antibond. And the difference between them is where do they physically fit in space? The bond takes up most of the space between the two nuclei and the antibond takes up space outside of that. And you can absorb a certain amount of light, usually in ultraviolet wavelengths, sometimes invisible, but usually in ultraviolet, to promote electrons from the bonding to the antibonding orbital. That makes that molecule more reactive. And in some cases, when we're in that promoted, excited state, we call it, we can have a chemical interaction take place, which is the genesis of photochemistry. And this is just an example of a really simple, this is for a hydrogen molecule, right? Where we've got just one S orbital on each of these two things. And if we're going to make H2 out of that, we're going to take this S orbital and this S orbital, we're going to combine them together to make a molecular orbital. And we get two orbitals out of that. We get the bonding orbital, which has its electron density in between the two nuclei. And we get the antibonding orbital, which in this case is outside and so, as you can imagine, if you were to, if you have two electrons in this bond, you would absorb a certain amount of light and put one of the two electrons into this antibonding orbital. That molecule is less stable and it's relatively easy through collisions with other molecules for this molecule to be broken apart and this hydrogen to be popped onto some other chemical reactant and cause a chemical reaction. Now, the one difference that happens in the atmosphere compared to uh, in the sort of watery envelopes is that when we break apart bonds, whereas, for instance, um, water molecules might break apart to H plus and OH minus in water, in the atmosphere, we're much more likely to make hydrogen atoms and hydroxyl uh, radicals, we call it. So basically, each thing takes back the electron it came to the party with. It's going to react with something else. But we don't tend to make charged species. Instead, we make what are called radicals. Radicals are simply unpaired electrons. So this idea of excited state, where we absorb light and we promote electrons into these antibonding orbitals, is critical to having photochemistry. And different molecules uh, are promoted to different excited state states uh, by specific quanta of energy. Um, can, which can be thought of as H nu, as I mentioned before, or H over lambda, lambda being the wavelength of light. So as, as we've talked about, the energetics of light varying as we go up with uh, elevation in the atmosphere, for the chemicals that have relatively short half-lives, they can react with light that's a little bit less energetic, that's kind of closer to the surface, and be destroyed there, you know, participate in chemical reactions there. For instance, the chemicals that are involved in photochemical smog, Whereas other molecules, which take more energy and so therefore happen higher up in the atmosphere, such as the breaking apart of chlorofluorocarbons, which leads to ozone layer thinning, they happen higher up. Each molecule has its own specific frequency at which it will absorb light and cause some <clears throat> reaction. So this just describes what I've already said, which is, is that as we go up, in elevation, we have more and more energetic light, more and more excited state molecules, and many molecules that absorb light in the ultraviolet will just simply re-radiate it back and go back down to the ground state without reacting. Others will break apart into fragments of either atoms or uh, multi-atomic fragments like hydroxyl radicals. And you know, still others of these things basically um, do, don't do anything they may just translate their extra energy into, into kinetic energy or something like that. So <clears throat> this brings up the idea of the ground state and excited states. And molecules uh, oftentimes have multiple excited states depending on how much um, light they absorb. And so in some cases they may react and in other cases they may not. But for most molecules, the ground state has the electrons in their molecular orbitals paired and paired the way you learned the off valve principle way back, you know, where one electron is spinning in one direction, the other spinning in the opposite direction, we show those as up and down arrows. <clears throat> and um, when we find unpaired electrons in most molecules, that is usually because of excited state. So you can flip the spin on an electron and not even promote it to a different orbital. And that can be an excited state. Like for instance, 
if you're supposed to have two electrons of opposite spin in a hydrogen molecule and you absorb some light just enough to flip them both to be positive spin, that's what we call an excited state. <clears throat> when we have unpaired electrons, a molecule with two unpaired electrons, we call that a singlet state. And a, a molecule of two, um, that when they're the opposite spin, and when they're the same spin, we call that a triplet state. And I've only illustrated that for you here because for oxygen, which is kind of a funny uh, molecule when you get down to it in detail, you can draw its chemical structure in a variety of different ways with one sp3 or sp2 hybridized bond and one what we call pi bond, which is above and below the plane of the molecule. That can be thought of uh, in for most molecules, we would populate this with two electrons. But it turns out that oxygen in the ground state is the lowest energy is actually um, you know, a triplet or a singlet state, depending on where we are in the atmosphere, which makes oxygen way more reactive than uh, nitrogen. <clears throat> it's this ability to flip back and forth and to promote electron from either both being in a pi bond or being into two different pi bonds, which sit uh, above and below the plane of the molecule that really gives it this interesting characteristic of reactivity. <clears throat> so this is from your text. This is from uh, chapter nine and in versions prior to the latest version where the number is less than one, okay, down by one. But it shows you a whole bunch of different chemical reactions that can take place. And there's a couple of notations I want to show you here. One of them is when there's a little asterisk, that implies something that has absorbed light and is in an excited state. So here, for instance, oxygen that has absorbed light can interact with M. M is just a third body. It could be a molecule of nitrogen. It could be a particle. It's something that just takes energy, right? So that oxygen can go from the excited state to the ground state, and M now has, has that extra energy. And that may be um, converted into translational energy, such as kinetic energy, just maybe moving more quickly. But the same oxygen atom that absorbs light, it could break apart the two oxygen atoms from an oxygen molecule to an atom. Or it can react with something else. This excited state oxygen could bump into an ozone and it could break it apart and make two molecules of oxygen molecules and an oxygen atom, which can then go on to do some other stuff because it's reactive. We can also have <clears throat> the, just dissipation of excited stateness by emission of light. Right, so uh, NO2, oxygen doesn't do this so much, but NO2 in the excited state, if it doesn't find something else to interact with, it can just re-emit some light. Um, we can also have chemical reactions where um, we take two ground state molecules, they react together to make something in the excited state. And um, so we've changed the oxidation state here of nit uh, nitrous oxide to nitric oxide. And it only happens when there's light present because this formation, this transformation will only take place in the presence of energetic light and as well as some oxygen with extra energy. You can have the transfer of energy from one excited state entity to another excited state entity. Um, and there's other chemical, these, these reactions are not nearly as important, um, but they take place. But the key thing about this is that there are other chemical entities that moderate these chemical reactions and that are there to absorb extra energy or to transfer energy and promote chemical reactions. And the three most important ones are hydroxyl radicals, oxygen atoms, and hydrogen peroxyl radicals. So hydroxyl radicals are just water molecules where we've ripped off a hydrogen atom and they're shown as a dot it's, the dot is different than the asterisk. I, I used a bigger dot because that's all I had is my font. But in the textbook, this is shown as a small dot kind of next to, on the side of a molecule, whereas the asterisk is always like as a superscript. That's how you can kind of tell the difference. This is the most important radical, tons of hydroxyl radical. And what makes it important is, is that it, it forms relatively easily, and there's a lot of it in the atmosphere that is produced and can moderate a lot of these other chemical reactions. It acts as an oxidant and uh, in many cases and can promote the breaking apart of other things. We also get oxygen atoms, as you see here, for instance, we get some oxygen atom. The radical isn't shown, but when an O2 breaks apart into two oxygen atoms, it is a radical. Hydrogen peroxide is 
um, H2O2. And if we rip off a hydrogen atom, we get HOO radicals. This is important in photochemical smog, as we'll talk about. We also get some NO nitrogen monoxyl radicals, different than NO gas, um, because it's basically the taking of an NO2 molecule, pulling off an oxygen atom, and being left behind with the NO. And these are all um, are important oxidants in the atmosphere. <clears throat> so this is another figure from your text that shows you the role that uh, hydroxyl radicals um, play, both in the things that control the concentration of it, the standing crop concentration, and the things that react with hydroxyl radical to go from one thing to something else, like halogens going to oxidize halogens or hydrogen sulfide going to SO2. And we'll talk more about some of these chemical reactions when we get into the details of them next week. But many things are either um, produced by or destroyed by hydroxyl radicals. And so anything that changes the proportion of hydroxyl radicals in the atmosphere, I think human activities, um, <clears throat> will affect the chemistry of the atmosphere. This slide summarizes the role of particles in you know, causing chemical reactions in the atmosphere. And so explaining how particles get up into the atmosphere, how particles absorb light, how chemical entities that interact on the surfaces of the particles can cause chemical reactions. And particles, in this sense, can be physical solids or they can be aerosols. Very ultrafine droplets uh, are also considered particles when we're talking about the atmosphere. And so <clears throat> they play an important role as well in monitoring a lot of chemistry. And the kinds of surface reactions, the chemistry that happens on particles, is a little bit different above and below the, the uh, tropopause. Above the tropopause, where the light is more energetic, particles play a major role in production and destruction and reactions of things like ozone. Below the tropopause, particles play um, a role in the kind of concentrations of standing crop chemicals, some of which are uh, respiratory irritants, such as, for instance, in photochemical smog, but they, they contribute in a slightly different way. Here is more uh, active sites for chemistry to happen. Here is uh, more involved in an actual storage and transfer of energy. Excuse me. So another thing to think about is the presence and absence of oxygen. Um, and there's kind of two relative things that affect the amount of oxygen. There's a relationship of oxygen and CO2 as in the photosynthesis and respiration cycle, which we've talked about ad infinitum. And right, obviously, as more CO2 goes into the atmosphere, because of respiration, less O2 goes into the atmosphere. So the buildup of oxygen in our atmosphere over our history implies more photosynthesis and respiration. There have been periods of time where that balance has been modified, but there are other sources of CO2 to the atmosphere that don't come along with oxygen, such as volcanic sources. And there are some ways that humans, especially the burning of fossil fuels, can control the amount of oxygen in the atmosphere by pulling carbon out of the ground, burning it, taking oxygen from the atmosphere, and releasing CO2. And so that has affected over our history. Our oxygen has slowly increased. And it's the increase in oxygen and the very presence of free oxygen in the atmosphere that allows us to have an ozone layer. If we didn't have an ozone layer, things would be very different in terms of distribution of life on the planet and distribution of chemical reactions on the planet, because that's essentially what defines the tropopause. So you just want to look at ozone too. Ozone is a really weird molecule, O3. When you try to draw up a little stop structure for it, you can draw it three ways. Um, two ways are Zwitter ions, right, with a formal distribution of charge. If you want to write out a version of the molecule that doesn't have uh, any charge in it, it is not a Zwitter ion, then you basically get one and a half bonds between the oxygen. There's like not a double bond and a single bond. As in the case of these, these are each of these bonds are kind of one and a half. And it's a very reactive gas. So it can act as an oxidant. It can also act as a base, even when it dissolves in water, it can produce hydroxide. And it is a you know, critical component of atmospheric chemistry. The interesting thing about ozone is the fact that it absorbs light in ultraviolet wavelengths, at least um, UVB and UVC. And this is just you know, showing you the kind of light absorption property in blue of ozone and the light sensitivity of DNA in purple. And 
basically you can make the argument that without the presence of the ozone layer, light would be in, of, of wavelengths that are short enough that the damaging to DNA would be impinging on the surface of the earth and we wouldn't have life out of the liquid envelope. Water absorbs these wavelengths of light. But it really is the co-evolution of the development of enough oxygen in our atmosphere to make an ozone layer, so the slow progress of photosynthesis over Earth's history, and the ability of that oxygen, some fraction of it to react to make ozone, which absorbs light in the correct wavelength for life to have even evolved onto the surface of the Earth. So ozone is, is super important. And this slide just kind of summarizes how oxygen built up over time in Earth's history, if you're interested. It's not described in the text. When we very first had the advent of photosynthesis, which we know goes back at least to 3.8 billion years, there's some evidence it goes back to even 4.4 billion years, but pretty much all of that oxygen that was being produced by photosynthesis went into oxidizing reduced metals and rocks. Stuff that we've talked about before, the surface of the Earth, like the surface of most of the other planets, has reduced iron and reduced manganese. And so when you start bleeding a little bit of oxygen in the atmosphere, it doesn't build up in the atmosphere. It mostly goes into oxidizing rocks or oxidizing the soluble iron and manganese that's in the water. There was a certain period of time, a couple billion years in, where we started to have enough oxidation of our bodies of water that we started to produce insoluble iron-3. And we see these as these red bed deposits around um, the surface of the earth or you know now preserved and the surface of the earth that came out of the proto-oceans. And what's interesting is, is that it took till about the Cambrian explosion, till about 570 million years ago, before we were done with all this stuff, we could actually start building up enough oxygen in the atmosphere to have an ozone layer to then be able to have organisms growing on land. So um, the very last part that I wanted to talk about, which sets us up for discussing uh, tropospheric ozone next time, is to just understand the relative importance of two things. One are reactive chemicals in the atmosphere that to contribute to the production and destruction of ozone, oxygen, oxygen atoms, ozone, and two different forms of nitrogen oxides. And we will see that, that ozone is a component, not only of the ozone layer in the stratosphere, having ozone is considered a good thing because it absorbs ultraviolet light, protects us on the surface of the earth, but it's also a major component of photochemical smog. So when ozone is produced in the lower atmosphere, that's a bad thing. Uh, we don't like that. And so, um, but the processes through which they are produced and destroyed are very similar with one sort of added ingredient, which is that up in the stratosphere, uh, addition of chlorofluorocarbons, which break apart to make halogens in the atmosphere, is um, what causes ozone destruction, what causes ozone production in uh, the lower atmosphere is the addition of organic gases that come out of um, the various you know, automobile exhaust races. But so the next slide, which is the last one I'll show you, sort of summarizes the role of ozone, oxygen atoms, and oxygen molecules together, production and destruction reactions. And we'll pick up the rest of the stuff next time. But when we think about ozone production, there's really only one way to make it. Take some oxygen, hit it with some light, make a couple oxygen atoms, and then take those oxygen atoms and react them with more oxygen, O2, to make O3. And, and we need one of these third bodies in there to pull away some of the energy, but that's how we make ozone. There's lots of ways to destroy ozone, okay? And this is the, what we as humans have upset in our stratosphere. So um, ozone destruction can happen by, you know, some fraction of the ozone molecules are gonna absorb light and it's gonna break them back apart. In some cases, these hydroxyl radicals which I've spoken of will react with ozone to make hydrogen peroxyl radicals and oxygen. And um, that's a catalytic reaction that basically just destroys the standing crop of ozone. The amount of nitrogen oxide that we put in the atmosphere can affect the amount of ozone by destroying it to make oxygen. This is another catalytic reaction in the sense that this reaction uh, starts with NO as reacting and ends up with NO as reacting. And all we've done is change the relative proportion of ozone and oxygen. This one, which is what we've done by adding halogen to hydrocarbons in the atmosphere, adding in chlorine radicals also destroys ozone, but in a relatively complicated process 
chlorine radicals, chlorine atoms, react with ozone to make oxidized chlorine radicals, CLO fragments, and oxygen. Those combine together to make peroxides. These peroxides can freeze into ice particles. This is part of the what contributes to um, the polar destruction of ozone naturally because it goes through seasonal periods of time where there's no light. And so all the chemical reactions that require light go away in the winter and these condense into clouds, which then when the light comes back on in the spring, this stuff gets re-released and produces these very reactive chlorine species, which break apart uh, into chlorine atoms and can react with more ozone. So again, it's a catalytic cycle. Starts with chlorine, ends with chlorine, the only difference is the relative proportion of ozone and oxygen. And then in the lower atmosphere, um, there's, um, as well as to some extent in the stratosphere, in places where we've had addition of nitric oxide, mostly it comes from airplane exhaust, we can make, we can take these same chlorine radicals and condense them instead of as this uh, peroxide species, we can condense them as this CLONO gas. It's basically, reacting these CLOs with NO2s. And it is like the equivalent of uh, nitric acid, but it's got a chlorine instead of a hydrogen. And this again can freeze into clouds and then get liberated when a light comes on and make chlorine. And so it's these two things which kind of contribute to stratospheric ozone destruction that is seasonally based because they require the light. And what we've done is change the relative amount of chlorine atoms that are present in the atmosphere and so what we've done is taken the standing crop of ozone that we have in the atmosphere over all of our history since we've had enough oxygen to make ozone, it's been a competition between these two things. This is always happening. These are always happening. But if we add more reactants, especially in the form of chlorine, plus if we add more particles, plus if we add a little bit more um, nitrogen oxide, any one of those three things then promotes the destruction of ozone, which is ozone layer thin. And that's the gist. Of, of ozone uh, layer thinning. So there's a few more slides in this packet that I'm not going to get to today. I'll just put them in next time. They are just about the physics of how the atmosphere circulates in the polar region, which also contributes to natural ozone thinning on a seasonal basis over each of the poles. Uh, so then, then we'll go into the, the topic of next time, which is how humans have upset these balances through our activities and what we know about the relative proportions at which these things are happening in mitigation strategies. And so, so are there questions about photochemistry or the atmosphere or any of these topics? I'm just curious, uh, do we not use the terminology residence time in the atmosphere? Uh, some atmosphere? people do. They tend to use mean lifetime. <clears throat> Atmospheric chemists are uh, like a different bunch. So they have, they tend to use slightly different terminology, but the concept is basically the same. The problem with the atmosphere is, is that it uh, is a little bit more difficult to define reservoirs. We have these layers and um, that boundaries between the layers, a little bit fuzzier. And depending on the specific gas that you're talking about, the transition from one to another may not happen right at one boundary or another. Mm -hmm. So they tend to think about mean lifetimes instead of residence time, but they're very similar conception. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're also, tend to think about things in terms of mixing volumes instead of concentrations. Mm -hmm. Mixing volumes allow you to basically not worry about the number density of concentration change as you go up. It's, it's sort of like uh, if you have a parcel of gas here, this 50% one gas molecule, 50% another, and you take it up to a much higher elevation, even if the concentrations of both have gone down, the uh, proportions are the same. They're still 50-50. And so when you think about strict geometry chemical reactions, they may become harder when the number density is lower because you know they just don't encounter each other, but the proportions are the same. And so that's why they tend to use these mixing volumes instead of concentration. So how do you how do you represent a mixing volume versus like in it's 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 usually given the units of ppm v, so okay. parts per million per volume, per volume. instead of whereas pretty much everywhere else we would think of parts per million on a mass per mass. Right. Okay. Yeah.